The words before us in verse 30 are in fact the sixth of seven sayings of Christ on the cross. So these words, it is finished, I would have to say are probably the most familiar words than any of the words, any of the sayings that Christ said on the cross. You may struggle to go through some of them, though we've read a couple already this morning and some more are in this chapter. But over the Gospels, there are the seven sayings of the Lord. And no doubt, as I said, the words, it is finished. They stand out uh, to be known among all God's people. They are known as they are often quoted in prayer. They are often seen uh, on a Bible verse as it's displayed on a church or in some outreach ministry. So these words, it is finished. Uh, are well known Uh, furthermore these words it is finished uh, are with a glorious uh, cry they are with that glorious shout of victory so these words are not weak words they're not defeated words however they are words of triumph they are words of victory they are the victory of Christ they are the victory of the cross in fact This victory is all the more seen that in the original rendering of this verse or of these words, it is finished. It is one word in the original, just finished, finished. They mean completed, perfected or accomplished. And so whenever Christ cried those words, finished, he was saying about his work of redemption, completed, perfected, accomplished, finished, nothing more to be done, nothing more to be added, nothing else any man can do, because Christ has done it all. He has finished the work that he was sent to do. Furthermore, these words, finished, it is finished, also signify continual results in other words the payment of christ for sin is still available today for the vilest offender who truly believes i'm glad today that his blood still washes away sin the words of the songwriter have not changed what can wash away my sin not just going to church not doing good works What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, the results of the cross are still continuing today that sinners are being saved. So we pray today that if you're here and you're not saved, that you will come and trust in the finished work of Christ. You can enter into the joy that God's people have right now by this claim, this shout of triumph, finished, perfected, completed. There is a perfect pardon with God. All sins put away. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is eternal peace. The guilt of sin has been removed. Heaven has been guaranteed. And therefore, what a joy it is for the people of God, all because these words it is finished and we have embraced those words and therefore as i said at the start these words are the most known words of all the sayings of christ uh, on the cross and as i said no doubt you have heard them in prayer you've prayed them in prayer you've seen them in bible text but have you actually stopped to think we said it a bit But have you actually stopped to consider what these words actually mean? What is finished? When Christ said these words, it is finished, finished, what does it actually include? And I want to look at that theme today as we think about these words, it is finished. What do they actually mean? How do they apply to our hearts? And there are four simple thoughts that I want to uh, leave with you this morning. Notice, first of all, the pain of his suffering 
was finished. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Luke 19 verse 10. He came to seek and to save them that were lost. John chapter 4 verse 34. The Savior said, my meat, my food, my desire is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish, to perfect, to accomplish his work. And therefore Christ Jesus came into this world to do the Father's will. He came into this world to obey God's will. He came into this world to finish the work that he was given him to do. And so in order to do that work, he must take upon himself human flesh in order to carry out the will of God and accomplish redemption for sinners. He must live a perfect life upon earth in order to offer up that life an atonement for sin. In other words, God's law has been broken, violated, transgressed by the sin of men. Men are hopeless. Men are helpless. Men cannot save themselves. God's law damns sinners. God's law calls out for our eternal damnation. And therefore Jesus Christ came with his life to live a perfect life, to obey every command and then to obey the penalty of the law, which is death. For the wages of sin, the payment of sin, is death. And therefore, through his life, he lived that perfect life. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. The word fault signifies guilt. I find no guilt in this man. His life has been examined. Never man speak like this man. The Lord said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so with the examination of his life, he lived a perfect life. And that is vital, men and women. Because if Christ did not live a perfect life, then he could not lay his life down as a sacrifice for sin. If there was one mistake that he made, if there was one error that he committed, if there was one wrong thought that he thought about, he could not be our saviour. And therefore, he came and he lived a perfect life. And because of his sinless life, he could then offer up that life on the cross as an atonement for sin, as a covering for sin. There he was wounded by men. He was beaten by men. He was mocked. He suffered at the hands of men. He suffered at the hand of God because he came to be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And therefore, he must endure the sufferings of the cross His substitutional, his sufferings were substitutional. That means he took the place of another. We deserve to be punished, but he took our place. He suffered what we should have suffered. He suffered not for sins of his own because he had none, but he suffered for the sins of all those he came to save. And therefore, upon the cross, he must be viewed and treated as guilty on behalf of those he came to save. He must be held responsible for sinners he came to save. He that knew no sin became sin for us. And therefore his suffering was no ordinary suffering. He suffered the horror of the cross he suffered the hours of darkness. He cried, I thirst. He was forsaken of God. He endured eternal hell. He endured eternal separation. He bore the wrath of God 
in his sufferings. The sword of God's wrath came upon him. He was smitten, stricken of God. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, Isaiah says. And the word bruise means to crush. The word bruise means to hammer. It pleased the Lord to hammer him. It pleased the Lord to crush him in our stead, in our place. And therefore, Jesus Christ went to the cross. And when he said, it is finished, the pain of his suffering was finished. He had finished what he was sent to do. He paid the debt of sin. He satisfied divine justice. He extinguished the wrath of God. And now, having entered into heaven, he lives in the power of an endless life. He is exalted on high. Oh, be sure today, men and women, the Lord Jesus Christ is not on the cross. He is not in the arms of Mary, weak and helpless, with tears coming down. Rather, he is alive forevermore. And therefore, he appears in the presence of God for us. The pain of his suffering was finished. Upon the cross, he did what he was sent to do. Pay the punishment, or suffer uh, the wrath of God for our sin. Therefore, child of God, we rejoice for our substitute. We rejoice for the one who took our place. Guilty as we were, vile and helpless, he took our place. Notice secondly, the pointers to his sacrifice were finished. When Christ said it is finished, that meant the pointers to his sacrifice were finished. In the Old Testament, the covenant of grace, that is the one message of redemption, that is the eternal agreement, that promise that Christ would come and pay the penalty for sin by the shedding of his blood, that covenant of grace, that promise of grace, that promise that Christ was saying, I will do what man cannot do for themselves. In the Old Testament, that was revealed by object lessons. Now, you may know what an object lesson is. Maybe you've taught it to your children. Maybe you teach it in Sunday school. You're taking an object and you teach a lesson from it. And so, in the Old Testament, God's plan of redemption was taught by object lessons, types, symbols, shadows, all promises and prophecies which pointed to Jesus Christ. Now, none of these object lessons themselves, they could not save anyone, nor could they remove guilt, but they were an object lesson to point to Christ. By what we are teaching in this object, here is what the promised Messiah will do. For instance, the when Christ said it is finished, when it is perfected, completed, all these pointers were not needed anymore. He accomplished them. He put them away. They had served their purpose. They pointed to Christ in his person and in his work, but they were not needed anymore because he was there himself. He is the fulfillment of them all. So you may know, for instance, of Genesis chapter 22, and you know about the story of Abraham and Isaac. And how Abraham takes his son, his only son, Isaac, up the mountain and there to the altar of sacrifice. And Abraham is going to give his son completely holy as a sacrifice to God. And his son asks the question, all the wood's here, everything else is here, but where is the lamb? Where is the sacrifice? Well, Isaac, you're the sacrifice. I'm going to offer up my son to God. As Abraham gets ready, he says, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. 
And as Abraham goes to offer up Isaac, God intervenes. And Isaac is set aside. And the animal that is offered up is offered up in Isaac's place. And it is sacrificed. Its blood is shed. Why? Again, to point forward to Calvary, to teach that Jesus Christ, who is God's only begotten Son, he is offered up on the cross of Calvary, the altar at Mount Calvary, to shed his precious blood. He took our place. He took our spot. He suffered in our stead. You think as well in Numbers chapter 22, you think about the serpent uh, that bit the people. And what did God tell Moses to do? He was to make a serpent of brass. And all who would look at that serpent, they would be healed. Again, what did Christ say in John chapter 3? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Speaking about his cross. Again, you can go through them all. Every single pointer. Even take the whole tabernacle scene. Everything within the tabernacle, it all pointed to Jesus Christ. And so, in keeping with the tabernacle, we think of those animals that were, that were slaughtered, their blood that was shed, they were offered up as sacrifices. Those animals, Leviticus tells us, in Leviticus chapter 1, every one of those animals, they were examined. They had to be perfect. They had to be without blemish. And then they were offered up again to point towards the one who would come in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ. He would be without blemish. He would be without spot. Again, on the Day of Atonement, Aaron, the high priest, would bring two goats to offer up. And one goat was taken. And this goat, its blood was shed. It was offered up to the Lord. It was the Lord's goat. And his blood was shed and his blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. To teach at the death of Christ. He is our sacrificial lamb. He is our mercy seat. His blood is our redemption. His blood is shed. His blood was not spilt accidental. His blood was shed. That was the first half of it. And then the second half, the scapegoat. Aaron then came out having shed the blood, offered up that goat to the Lord. Aaron then came out with the other goat and laid his hands on that goat and prayed over that goat, confessing the sins of the people of Israel. And then that goat was let loose into the wilderness, never to come back. They would never see it again. And again, the whole point is, it was an object lesson to teach redemptive truth. That goat itself could never take away sin. The blood of that goat could never take away sin. It was an animal. But it pointed towards Jesus Christ. Here is what Christ will do when he comes. Here is what it means when he cried, it is finished. The first half, his blood was shed and offered up on behalf of sinners. And then he took all our sins to its very own body and did away with them. He put them behind his back, never to be remembered anymore. And therefore, here's the great truth, child of God. Here's the great blessing of the words, it is finished. For all who have come and put their trust in Jesus Christ, all our sin has been given over to him, has been imputed to him, and all his righteousness has been imputed to us. All our sin has been put behind his back and therefore sin put away will never be sin come against you again. You will never stand trial for that sin. You will never be judged for that sin. You will never be in hell for that sin. It has been put away. He has blotted them out. So just as the Israelite was taught 
as that goat is sent away into the wilderness, it will never come back again. So our sins that have all been placed upon Christ, he was judged for our sin, so we will never be judged for that sin. He bore the hell of our sin, that we would never uh, go to hell for our sin. And therefore, here's the blessing, child of God, for you who are redeemed by precious blood. When God looks upon you today, he sees his beloved son. He sees Christ. He sees forgiveness. He sees your sins gone away. But for those who are not saved, his wrath abides upon you. For those who are not saved, you're still under the judgment of sin, heading for a lost eternity. And you must come today and be saved because if you die in your sin, you will face eternal damnation in hell. You will face the torments, the wrath of God in a lost hell forever and ever and ever for all eternity. And therefore, here's the hope of these words. It is finished for all who trust in Christ. That judgment has been settled. That payment has been settled. And therefore, what a blessing these words are. It is finished. The um, pointers of his sacrifice has been finished. Therefore, you don't need to come to a priest anymore. You come to Christ yourself. You don't need to come with an animal to church, bring a big cow in and shed its blood. Christ is your offering. You don't need to go to a confessional box. Christ is our altar. He is our everything. You don't need to go and pray to some statue. You come to Jesus Christ Himself, He has done away with every pointer. They all pointed to him. And therefore he fulfilled them. It is finished. But notice also, thirdly, the promise of his success was finished. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, we read of the first gospel promise concerning Jesus Christ and his work. It is the promise of the Savior. In the Garden of Eden, the Lord speaking to Satan, and he gives a promise that he will defeat Satan, and he will seal Satan's doom, all by the victory of the cross. Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so did you hear, did you see the victory of those words, the guarantee that Christ would conquer and defeat Satan? I will put, it shall bruise. There is no ifs, buts, or maybes. There is no plan B. There is no, well, I will try to do this, or I hope to do this, or, well, this is my plan to attempt this. No. I will do this. I will defeat Satan upon the cross. And here is the triumph of these words uh, in Genesis 3.15. I will. I will do this. Jesus Christ came into this world to save his people from their sin. And therefore... Upon the cross of Calvary, when he said, it is finished, he defeated Satan. He bruised Satan's head. He crushed Satan's head. He rendered him powerless, helpless. You see, if you think of a serpent, of a snake, its power lies in its head. I don't know if you like watching wildlife programs. I do. I see these wee snakes coming across like this and sort of go like this and then they open up their mouths like that. They're all wide and they get their prey and start sucking them in like this here. And that's why you see when people grab the snake, they, 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 they cover their head in a bag because it makes it powerless, helpless. It can't do anything. 
It's all the power. And they had, if you grab a snake by the tail and start going like this, oh, good, I have victory over the snake. Well, it's going to turn around and start getting you. And so the whole point of defeating the snake, it is to get its head. And I'm not suggesting you go out looking for snakes anywhere and try and do that. But the point is, it's the head has the power. And so on the cross, Satan crushed his head. In other words, Satan rendered him powerless, defeated him, hopeless. And therefore, all for whom Christ died for, whom his blood was shed, he has purchased eternal life. That's why he said, I give on to my sheep eternal life. They can never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You're safe and secure in Jesus Christ. Not even the devil uh, can uh, take you. Not even the devil can take you away. No man can pluck them out of my hand. What does that word mean in John chapter 10? No man can pluck them out of my hand. It means to take away by force, to carry away by force. Again, don't know if you like chickens or, or not, uh, or if you've ever plucked a chicken yourself. And you get the, the feathers. When I was in, uh, as you know, my wife's from Dominican Republic, and over there they just wouldn't buy, uh, go to the shop as we would do, and buy the chicken in the shop and see it all as it is, all packaged up and all the rest. Well, the part that we were in anyway, her auntie, got this big massive chicken and killed it there and then. And then pluck all these feathers out. You're taking it by force. And that's what it means. No man shall pluck you out of my hand. No man shall take you by force out of my hand. No man can put his hand upon you. We're safe and secure. Why? Because on the cross, what Christ promised to do, he succeeded in doing. He defeated the devil. And therefore, that's why a Christian can never be in hell. And so what a glorious truth that is. John, 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose the son of man was manifested for this purpose he appeared why that he might destroy the works of the devil hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and so christ won the victory over satan rendering him powerless sealing his doom Christ accomplished redemption for all his people. He secured redemption by his blood. Therefore we can sing, O victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. There's victory by the precious blood, by the power of the blood. And the blood has power to save all who will come to him. Oh, therefore, sinner, today you say, but I have a lot of sin. I have great sin. I have many sins. Well, you come to Christ. Because the blood cleanses from all sin. All sin. Every sin. You can be saved today. You can be cleansed today in the precious blood. Because there's victory in the blood. And therefore you must come today and have your sin forgiven. Why live a defeated life? Why live a life on the road to hell? Why live a life of doom and gloom? Come to Christ today and be on the road to eternity. Beyond the road to heaven, beyond the road uh, to Emmanuel's land, knowing that your sin has been forgiven, knowing that you can go to bed each night, and whatever happens that night or the next day, it's well with your soul. Because, Christian, you do not lose out. A Christian never loses out. And therefore, you pass from death on to life. We live in the victory of the cross. Let me tell you. Today is victory day for the child of God because all that Christ did was for his people. All Christ did was to secure redemption for his people. That his suffering had come to an end. The pointers to his sacrifice has come to an end. The promise of his success. It was all finished. He did what he set out to do. Therefore, today, child of God, you rejoice in your Savior. You serve a victorious Savior. That's why we believe in the success of the cross. That's why we believe in the victory of the cross. Jesus Christ did all that he set out to do. 
He did all that he came to do. Because finally and briefly, the payment for sinners was finished. When Christ suffered upon the cross, he was paying the penalty of the law, the debt that was due to our transgressions in breaking God's law. Therefore, Jesus Christ himself is the ransom price. He honored God's law by giving that perfect life, by offering himself his blood and atonement. He secured deliverance. And then always remember, child of God, that this debt, Christ paid it in full. There is no bargaining. Bargaining. That's why we said it's a covenant of grace, because it's God doing for men in Christ what men cannot do for themselves. Christ did it all. Christ didn't do 99% of the work and leave you to do 1%. Christ didn't do a halfway job. I'll go so far and I'll leave it for you to do the rest. No. He paid the debt in full. Therefore, child of God, the only way we can be, del- or sinner, the only way we can be delivered from the curse of the law, from eternal damnation, is trusting in all that Christ has done. Trusting that he has paid it all. And that is the idea. It is finished. Salvation does not depend upon you. Salvation does not depend upon you coming to church every single week, though you should be here. But it does not depend upon that. It does not depend upon our works of righteousness. It does not depend how much effort we put into it. It all depends and rests on Jesus Christ. Therefore, he paid the debt in full. What great words these are. What great encouragement this is. We stand complete in Christ. All our iniquities was laid on him. And that means because they were laid on him, they can never be laid back upon me. Payment twice, God will not demand. And therefore, dear believer, you can rejoice this day in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Nothing left. For you to be done, for, for to be done when it comes to salvation. But sinner today, we pray that you will trust in the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our brother has already said about the Easter eggs. And I hope, well, I don't know what the weather's like, I'd say I hope they're not all melted. But nonetheless, when these eggs are given out, in a sense, freely, no doubt there'll be those who will come to grab them. And so God's offer of salvation the free gift of salvation, he paid the price. And therefore, come to him today and receive this gift of salvation. Receive this gift of all he had done when he said, it is finished. How can you be saved today? Do I have to go home and type in 12 steps to heaven? Do I have to go into some program, some group of people? No, no. You can be saved where you are. You can simply just call upon the Lord, save me, forgive my sin, whatever phrase you want to use. Because salvation is not found in a prayer. Did I pray right? Did I pray long enough? Did I pray hard enough? Salvation is found in Jesus Christ himself. And therefore, where you're sitting right now, you can ask him to save you, and he will. Child of God, you can leave today rejoicing. It's well with you. You can leave rejoicing that Christ has finished the work, successful on your behalf. And therefore, whenever you leave this scene of time, whenever it's your time to depart earth, you know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It is finished. Therefore, I pray today that you will rejoice in all that Christ has done for his own glory and his own namesake. 
Amen. We'll just hand the meeting back over to our dear brother. Thank you.